It's an expedition like no other before. That's our entry point. We're going to drop down in there. Dave will feed the ROV. Comcheck's got They're it. among the world's foremost underwater explorers. We are going to feed Tether. It's an exploration of America's most sacred war memorial. The wreckage of the battleship USS Arizona. We want people to understand that this was a living, breathing ship. That's the door. The ship is a war grave. 1177 men died. It was devastating. It was unbelievable. The attack on Pearl Harbor, an assault no one saw coming. We thought we were invincible. They were coming right over us. And then we caught the big bomb. A blow that would sink the Arizona and change the course of history. December 7th. 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Now, 75 years later, that is awesome. these explorers are setting out to bring the Arizona back to life. Wow, look at that. Unbelievable. And for one survivor, it's like a homecoming. Kind of interesting to see what all the time and the sea has done with our Old home. The remains of the sunken battleship USS Arizona. It's still a behemoth. Traces of life from the morning of the attack, still visible today. They remain, they stay on the decks, and they're preserved as a touchstone to the history and the events that happened here on December 7th. They seemed to come from nowhere. On December 7th, 1941, unidentified planes appear in the sky over Pearl Harbor. Then I saw one of the planes with the rising sun on it, and I said, my god, those are Japanese planes. They were flying low enough where you could see the pilots' faces. An assault no one saw coming. The United States fleet was caught napping. Our planes were parked in nice, neat rows on the, on the ground. They were destroyed very easily. Then, the Japanese pilots turned to the vessels moored in port in the harbor. Their biggest prize, the battleship USS Arizona. 10,000 feet above the harbor, a Japanese cake bomber has Stratton's ship in the crosshairs. The fireball probably went about 1,000 feet in the air. What's left of the Arizona is engulfed in flames. We didn't very, wasn't very successful. We got, all of us got pretty well fried up there. I lost part of my ear and my hair was gone and the skin on my arms just was hanging down like a sock and I just pulled it off and threw it down because it was in the way. The blazing fire reaches Stratton high up in the gun director, burning 70% of his body. He is one of the few survivors topside. Another fire controlman. He and I and were the only two survivors from that platform. One of the gentlemen on the opposite side of my director, where I was at, he, something hit his head and busted him open. The blow deck people were fighting the water and the fires. The water just come in and couldn't stop it, and just, just some ship just sank.
On board the Arizona, the few survivors try to get off the ship. We went out on deck and got the attention of a seaman aboard the vessel. A sailor on the repair ship Vestal moored next to the Arizona throws Stratton and the other survivors a rope. Tied it up on the Arizona and started to go hand over hand across the line. Below them, oil flames and red hot metal from the burning ship. That was probably 70, 80 feet across that line to the Vestal. The world still doesn't know about Pearl Harbor. But this is about to change. It is football Sunday, and across the country, people listen to the games. A local radio station in New York City is the first one to break the news. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. At the same time in Washington, the Japanese envoys pay a visit to the State Department. They deliver a note from their government. It's a brief meeting. Japanese diplomats in Washington were receiving instructions from Tokyo in a coded message that said that relations with the United States would be broken off, in effect, meaning war was inevitable. In the White House, President Roosevelt receives the first comprehensive report of the attack on Pearl Harbor. At this moment, FDR has become a wartime president, and his role is very different. And he, I believe in his own thoughts, had to think about the massive responsibility that had been placed upon his shoulders and how he was gonna lead the American people in the war that was to follow. But in reality, the situation is far worse. Washington has yet to learn that the Japanese have sent a second wave of 170 planes. The battle rages for another hour. The horrific memories of that day have never left the survivors. that firing going on. 18 vessels, including eight battleships, destroyed or damaged. All in one hour and 50 minutes. I remember us looking down there and crying, uh, grown men crying. Servicemen rushed to the docks to rescue any survivors. I ran down the dock about 50 feet and caught an officer's barge. I spent the next four hours out there swimming underwater most of the time because the diesel had leaked out of the ships and caught fire. In four hours, I picked up only 46 people. Some of them were dead already. Some were badly wounded, some badly burned, some were just tired because they got blown off the ship or jumped off and had to be to the shore. Seeing the desolation and, and, and the carnage, bodies in the water floating. I was swimming for four hours out there in the water on December 7th. I get sick every time I go in the water. I would have nightmares. But after that, you know, I just shrugged it off. Now, 75 years later, the expedition team has a chance to see inside the ship like never before. After weeks of preparation, the expedition team sets its sights on exploring the ship's interior. For Don Stratton, this exploration is an opportunity to see inside his ship again, something he has been eager to do since the day of the attack. If 
we can give him the gift of being able to see in his old ship one last time, in real time, that, that's, that's meaningful for everybody. The first step of the interior exploration, to scout the Arizona's second deck with two small ROVs. Later, the team will use more advanced equipment to explore deeper inside the ship, areas that haven't been seen since the attack. So the idea is to really get into the second deck to start, um, navigate down a couple of passageways we know we have access to, and then find uh, new entry points to get below down into the third decks and beyond um, that we feel like we can reach with this ROV technology. Although the exploration team doesn't know the exact state of the wreckage, they are certain they won't observe any human remains. Working inside the Arizona is obviously a very sensitive issue with the loss of life there. And people always ask about human remains and, and the people that lost their lives in the Arizona. Sediment accumulation over 75 years and natural decay has most likely erased any traces of the deceased. We want to pan and fly left. So keep left then? Yeah, keep going left. We're going to put the wall right in front of us. Yeah. We want to follow that. As these ROVs drag their tethers behind, their reach is limited. You can't travel all that far into the vessel because you need to be able to turn around and come back out. You might get snagged as you go around a corner. You know, all sorts of different things can happen once you're in the ship. Okay, so go forward here. Go down that. Go that way. Do you want me to the right? Go, no, go right straight. Okay, great. Yeah, so we'll go, we want to go left. The ROV enters the area where the officers lived. the officer's wardroom on the starboard side of the vessel. We're going to go pretty slowly in the air, so yes. we're trying to not stir up too much. The wall cabinet with soap dishes. That's pretty cool. No, it's okay. No, it's really soapy. The soap dish looks white, so it must be a porcelain. In, in the past, we've seen uh, cups, things that are porcelain in nature, don't collect marine growth. They stay white. Everything the way it was left on the morning of December 7th. Cool. And you can see in this particular cabin, the, the sink looks like it's on the floor because of the high sediment load. So this is another way to allow the survivors to remember what it was like to see what their shipmates endured and to strengthen that bond. It sure brings back a lot of memories. Don will miss the exploration of the deeper decks. But for him, just this first look inside has brought his old home back to life. The phone was there on the desk, and the light bulb was in the socket, and it's just kind of eerie. Who would ever think that you'd see something like that 75 years later?
By the end of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, 21 U.S. ships have been sunk or damaged. 2,403 people are killed. 1,177 on the Arizona alone. The fires on the ship rage for more than two days. We were in blackout conditions in those days. Nobody could have any lights on their houses or anything. The only light you could see on the whole island was the burning of the Arizona. After the fire subsides, Seaman Sterling Kale is assigned to lead a group of 10 sailors to recover bodies from the wreckage. I think about the first thing we saw in the air, it was a bunch of ashes blowing off of this ship. So I just sort of sank down on my church and said a few tears. We saw a bunch of helmet liners lying across the ship. Nobody around close to them. Many of the men were in ashes behind the big guns on the ship. A lot of the men had burned right down to the deck. We also found a bunch in the aft fire control tower that got caught by the flames. They'd been reduced to charcoal. After the recovery of more than 200 bodies, the Navy is forced to stop the retrieval effort because of increasingly dangerous conditions. Salvage of the ship's superstructure above the waterline continues for another year. The decision is made to leave the Arizona where it lays, creating a lasting memorial to the fallen that remain entombed in the ship. Now, 75 years later, the expedition team has a chance to see inside the ship like never before. Using a custom-built ROV specifically designed for the ship's deeper sections, the team hopes to access the Arizona's lower decks. There's a certain amount of anxiety when we have this narrow timeline that we need to hit in time for the anniversary. So there's a fair amount of pressure to make sure that the ROV works. That's our entry point. We're going to drop down in there. Dave will feed the ROV, and we'll stay in the second deck, make sure everything works, that you guys have control, cameras, all that. Cool. They created this really cool solution, which is essentially a big spool that pays out the cable as you go in and then picks the cable back up as you go out. And the advantage there is you're not always pulling on, on the cable to get it further into the vessel. The new self-spooling tether is designed to prevent the ROV from getting snagged inside the ship, a problem that has plagued previous Arizona expeditions. The stakes are high. The team has prepared months for this day, and funding is limited. These types of expeditions take energy, money, time, and people to accomplish. The mission does rest on the ability of the ROV and the tether system to work. When we go in there, we need to be effective and we need to be successful because we may not get another chance for another 15 years. It appears that their new ROV and its self-spooling tether is finally operating as expected. It works. It's just a question of whether or not it'll, it'll work flawlessly, <laughs> you know, the first time going in the rack.
So basically what we'll do is we'll drop the ROV down and we'll investigate the second deck and find access points or, or stairwells or hatches that go down and drop the ROV down in the third deck. Below the second deck onto the third deck, we get into an area that we don't really know what's there. The divers approach a hatch at the stern of the deck, carefully lowering the ROV down to the second deck. Go to the right. Slowly, the ROV moves midship. 10 feet. 10 feet. Give us 10 feet of tether, please. 10 feet. This area, known as Officer's Country, was not impacted by the blast. Can we go forward and left? OK. Here. Much of the ship's structure has remained intact. It's the world Ensign Whedon documented with his home movies, just a few months before the attack. The crew carefully maneuvers the ROV towards the cabins on the left side. Get me 10 more feet. Can we get 10 feet of tether? 10 feet? Give us 10 feet, please. Entering the ship's ladies' room for the guests of the ranking officers. That is amazing. Wow. The mirror still intact. Let's go to the left, pile it out, and then make a hard turn. So let's go through there. The Admiral's cabin. The splendor still visible. That is awesome. The ghostly outline of a table. That's very cool. What do we have going on here? And we're just flying over that table that we see from that open porthole right. with a light fixture, and we're moving towards the aft of the ship, towards this cabinet back here. In August of 1941, Ensign Whedon writes to his sister. Things have been really great, for we ate dinner with the Admiral and showed the girls the ship. The girl I escorted is the cutest. So, Bernadine, everything is turning out swell now. Don't you worry, for I am on one of the safest ships afloat. So we'll go up and see if there's any furniture along this way. crew discovers something they have not seen before. Oh, wow. What is that? What is it? Like, there's a ton of sediment, but it's... It's something one would not expect to find on a battleship. Those are bricks. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah it, it is brick. It's definitely uh, brick. It is. It's Wait, it has, a, it, it has a vent on it. it it looks like a fireplace. There's no, there's no record of a fireplace in the Admiral's cabin on the, on the as-builds. Wow. They did customize these ships. 
That's crazy. That's fabulous. The team continues their search for traces of the life on board before the attack. With fresh, oxygen-rich seawater constantly flowing through, all but the most durable traces of life on board have deteriorated on the second deck. But deeper down in the ship, conditions might be different. Really, the push is to get below the second deck, because we think the third deck holds the key to the environment of Arizona. Information about the microbiological environment, about the dissolved oxygen, we think the third deck really holds the keys to a lot of those questions. Searching for a passage to the third deck, the team steers the ROV forward, closer to the blast area where the wreckage is torn open. I'd like to see if we could get forward a little bit and start to look at where the blast damage starts to occur. The blast zone is a startling reminder of the power of the explosion that sunk the Arizona. The 1,760-pound shell that hits the Arizona doesn't explode on impact. Equipped with a delayed fuse, it cuts through the armored main deck, dropping down next to the ship's forward magazines an area filled with gunpowder bags. As the charge goes off, it sets off a flash igniting the gunpowder. Superheated gases form, destroying everything in its way and breaking through the deck. The force of the explosion lifts the forward structure of the Arizona 30 feet into the air. In many ways, the bomb that was dropped from almost directly above the Arizona was the perfect shot because it penetrated through the decks, it detonated right next to or in the powder magazine and inflicted a crippling blow. Powder bags from the magazines are blown into the air and ignite like fireworks. Seventy-five years later, with the decks collapsed, it is difficult to maneuver the ROV close to the blast zone. Have them give me uh, 10 feet. Can you give us 10 feet of feather, 10 feet, please? As we get closer to the blast zone, you can see the structural components are actually leaning down. Some of those may have fallen over or are in the process of falling over. And, and that's why we're in the ship, is to visually inspect those types of things. So let's see, let's see if it goes down and we can penetrate down in, you know, in yeah. below decks. Yeah, it looks like there is an opening there, but there is. But it looks like, you know, we could go look down there and see if it's an opening, not go too far. Okay. okay. If not, we'll, we'll back out. They can see the third deck, but there is no safe passage to get there. The team could very likely lose the ROV if they go any further. If an ROV goes inside the Arizona and gets hopelessly entangled, then the ROV will stay there forever. We will never send divers in to go get them. So there's that to consider in terms of how far you explore, how far you push the edge of, of what you need to access. After investigating the wreckage for more than three hours, the team decides to pull the ROV back out and to look for a better access point down to the third deck. Your first few dives in the Arizona, you're actually kind of struggling to figure out where you are. It's a tangled disarray of metal and iron and, and steel. It's basically the last one third of the ship that's still intact that we would consider plausible to, to investigate with an ROV. The divers approach another opening in the hull of the vessel, giving them access to a different section of the second deck. 
there's a triangle that has deteriorated in one of the bulkheads that is large enough to fit an ROV. And that provides us a direct access point down a central hallway. In the hallway, they hope to have access to a hatch leading down to the third deck. But if the ROV gets stuck behind the wall opening, it would be lost, a risk they have to take now since their expedition is coming to a close. I mean, it's the USS Arizona. It deserves everything that we can do to try to understand what's happening to what's there so that we, you know, we can have it last for future generations. If we move left, we should run into the... The hatch appears to be unobstructed. So let's go in and take a look and see what we see here. But steering the ROV down to the lower deck is a challenge. It's dark. I mean, there's no light inside the ship. It's complete black. So the only light that you have is light that's on the ROV itself. We're in. Awesome. Here on the third deck, the environment looks much different. They begin their search for evidence of the lives of those who once served here. If we're navigating down a hallway and there's a door, that becomes a judgment call. Is it, is it large enough for the ROV to fit through? And if it fits through, do we think we can turn around the ROV on the other side of that door and fly it back out? Oh, wow. A cabin nobody has seen for 75 years. Is that like a foot locker there? Oh, it looks like a, some kind of square, doesn't it? Completely undisturbed, everything still in its place. A bed, as it was left on the morning of the attack. They travel on, deeper into the ship, entering another cabin. Kind of want to peer, <laughs> like you want to peer around the side of the monitor to get to, to get a better view. It's angled, so it looks like we're, we're at the hull. So come back up. You have no vertical? Whoa, what's that? Hang on, stop spooling. What is that? It's a button of some type. It's a hat. No way. Oh, that's Wait, look. Oh, yeah. You get a strap? Yeah. You're right. It's like opening a time capsule. That has to tell us, you know, about the interior condition. This, this, this must not have oxygen. I mean, it must be really low in oxygen. Low oxygen concentration slows the decomposition of organic matter. It's an unexpected find. A reminder of the men who lived and died here. And of the world Ensign Whedon documented with his camera in 1941.
While there is still much left to be explored, the crew ends the day with a feeling of success. You're staring at somebody's suit. It's been there for 75 years, and it's, I mean, it's hanging on a hanger in, in, in an officer's cabin. I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to be kind of objective about science when you're staring face to face on a, on a uniform that's, that's been there for 75 years on the USS Arizona. It's, uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable, actually. It's unbelievable. One thousand five hundred eleven crewmen served on board the USS Arizona on the morning of December seventh, nineteen forty one. Only a few survived. One thousand one hundred seventy seven men died in the explosion and ensuing fires. Ensign Whedon was one of them. It was a Sunday, and my mother was setting the table, and the doorbell rang, and she went to answer the door, and it was the neighbor. And she just said, Bernadine, turn on your radio. Hawaii's under attack. And that's how they found out. He had big dreams. His goal was to have his own ship. He had a mission. He knew what he wanted to do. And his ultimate goal was to be Admiral of the Navy. Ensign Whedon's body was never found. But now, at last, his family has seen the world the young officer lived in. The devastating attack united a nation. In the explosions at Pearl Harbor, there was forged the will for complete and absolute victory over the forces of evil. The Japanese admirals in attacking Pearl Harbor did something that FDR and the Democratic Party could not do. It unified the American people. Just as 9-11 brought out America's will to fight in Iraq and Afghanistan, so did the attacks on Pearl Harbor push America to war in Asia and Europe. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. One day after the attack, the United States declares war against Japan and subsequently against the empire's European allies, too. The Japanese strategy was based on a flawed view of the United States. The belief was that if you could attack the United States, shock them, and prove that it would be a very long, hard-fought contest to defeat Japan, that you could force the United States to realize that this was going to be a long and costly war and come to the negotiation table on terms favorable to the Japanese. And the Japanese also failed in their military goal to cripple the US fleet and render it useless. Some say because they missed the fleet carriers at Pearl Harbor. Approximately six hours before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese strike group commander, Admiral Nagumo, got intelligence that the United States carriers were not in Pearl Harbor. The decision was up to Nagumo, cancel the attack or proceed without the ability to knock out the American carriers in port. Preparations for the attack continued as planned. For the Japanese, the US Navy's battleships were a more valuable target anyway. 
By missing these carriers, focusing on the battleships, the Japanese admirals were living in the past, and the war would come home to them in the very near future. The Japanese newsreels sell the attack as a decisive victory, but the strike force ignored other important targets, too. Like Pearl Harbor's ship repair yard. It's a costly error. Within a matter of just months, 18 of the 21 ships damaged in the attack are salvaged and operational again. And an even greater tactical blunder by Japan. They didn't destroy the base's fuel storage. Had they attacked these oil reserves, they could have possibly taken the ability of America to sortie its Pacific fleet and taken about a year of oil out of American hands. This would have actually done far more to delay an American counterattack than sinking outdated battleships. Only six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese fleet stages an invasion of the Midway Atoll and battles US forces stationed there. But this time, the US Navy is prepared. The Battle of Midway was an intelligence failure for Japan. They did not know their naval codes had been compromised, and they actually telegraphed their plan to the United States. Four Japanese carriers were sunk, tide reverses, and the United States and, and the Allies began winning battles and moving towards Japan. In February of 1945, the U.S. forces reach the volcanic island of Iwo Jima, an island that belongs to the Japanese homeland. Using cannons salvaged from the Arizona, the USS Nevada opens fire on the island and attacks the hideouts of Japanese soldiers. The shelling continues for three days. Then, 30,000 Marines storm the beaches. A brutal fight ensues. Battle consisted of some of the nastiest, most protracted fighting of World War II. Uh, fighting in close quarters, fighting with flamethrowers, grenades. Japanese had dug into the uh, coral reefs around Iwo Jima, into the hills. It was a fight to the death, a bitter, knockdown, drag-out fight. Five days into the battle, U.S. troops reach Mount Suribachi, raising the flag on Japanese soil. It might be the most famous war photograph ever captured. The battle for Iwo Jima rages on for over a month. It was a fight that ultimately cost the lives of 7,000 American soldiers and about 19,000 Japanese soldiers. One week later, the U.S. forces reach the island of Okinawa, the gateway to the Japanese mainland. It's the last stop on Americans' island hopping campaign before the planned invasion of the Japanese home islands. The battle was savage. It was fought on land and air and on the sea. The Japanese begin to employ kamikaze tactics and attack the American strike force at sea. Over 1,400 suicide pilots are sent to their death. They damage or destroy at least 30 U.S. warships, killing 4,900 U.S. servicemen. 
Shogunate was the first use on a large scale of Japanese kamikaze tactics. It had a profound effect on the United States, and it hardened our resolve uh, to end the war with Japan as quickly as possible. On land, the death toll is even higher. It is the bloodiest battle of the Pacific War. 75,000 American and more than 100,000 Japanese soldiers lose their lives. It is the beginning of the end of the war in the Pacific. For many, the Battle of Okinawa was a prelude of an invasion of the Japanese home islands. The long protracted fight, the Japanese shocking use of mass scale suicide attacks. Because of this savagery, many people were relieved when the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All right, Brett's good. While the impact of World War II will never be forgotten, its history reminds us about the perils of war and the importance of learning from our past. In Oahu, Hawaii, 75 years after the attack on Pearl Harbor, a Japanese naval contingent pays their respect to the fallen soldiers. Former enemies are now friends and allies, united by memories of a war that ended millions of lives. There, there is no more living history around at some point with these events. And the Arizona offers us an opportunity to keep history alive. We want people to understand that this was a living, breathing ship. This was manned by people who, who lost their lives in a, in, in a blink. For Don Stratton, the remains of the Arizona remind him to never take life for granted. I'm glad they've been able to do that. I don't want the United States to forget about this and that it could happen again. People like myself ought to keep this country free. But my shipmates that are still there, they're really the heroes. It's been a long time. God bless.